In this video, I'll describe industry analysis. So to start off, I'll define sectors and then industries, and then I'll talk a little bit about the industry classification systems that we use, and then I'll describe the factors that affect industries, and then finally I'll wrap up by describing the data resources you have at your fingertips. So let's get started. What you're looking at right now are the GICS sector PE ratios through time. Each of these different lines represents a different sector of the economy, and you're arguably very familiar with some of these sectors. The financial services sector, the utility sector, the tech sector, real estate, etc. Now, what I want to illustrate here is twofold. First, when we define sectors, there are 11 sectors of the U.S. economy. You're looking at them right now. These are well-known sectors. This is the standard breakdown for sectors. The other point I want to make is that each of these sectors is a little different. As you can see, as of the time I pulled this data, the real estate sector had the highest P.E. ratio. Now, P.E. ratios are indicative of expected future growth in earnings. And down here at the bottom, as we might expect, we see a couple of industries, namely energy, having the lowest P.E. ratio, which is, I mean, it's obviously been fairly common for the last several years. Uh, essentially, energy is very profitable, but we don't expect to see much growth in this sector going forward. Now, this GICS breakdown of sectors is really the only breakdown that we have for sectors. For industries in each sector, it's a little different. When we talk about an industry, there are a couple of different ways that we break that industry down. The first is into SIC codes, or Standard Industry Classification Codes. And SIC codes are a little older than some of the other industry classification systems. Uh, they were created a long time ago prior to the development of the internet. So SIC codes really don't have a good breakdown of internet or tech companies. And that's where NIAX codes come in. NIAX codes, or North American Industry Classification System codes, these are actually more modern. I believe they were developed in the 90s. These actually account for the tech sector. You can look up NIAX codes or SIC codes for a lot of firms. SIC codes are easier to find. Uh, but generally, the way this breaks down is the longer the, the NIAX code or SIC code, the more granular the data is. So let's take a look at this. So here we have an example of one NIAX code. NIAX codes are six digit, whereas SIC codes are four digit. So this NIAX code, we start off with 23, and that's the construction industry. 236, construction of buildings. 2361, residential building construction. And we can go down and down and down all the way down to residential remodelers. I can't imagine there's too many publicly traded firms that have this NIAX code. Now, if you want to see how to get this in Bloomberg, let me show you. The way we look up industries in Bloomberg is by using the ICS function, or classification browser. And this will allow us to search for firms in an industry based on any number of classifications. So GICS, I've talked about down here near the bottom, we sh oh, in, in the middle, we have SIC codes. So if I click here, and let's say I want to look at the, we'll say mining sector. We have coal, metal, we'll go with oil, and we have crude petroleum, natural gas, we'll go natural gas, liquids, and as you see, we have 10 different firms that identify themselves with these SIC codes. And if we hover over the natural gas liquids, we can see that their SIC code is 1321. If we hover over natural gas liquids, or let's say oil and gas extraction, that industry code is 13. All right, now it's easy to identify the firms in an industry if you have access to Bloomberg, uh, 
But our real focus here is on industry analysis. So when we talk about industry analysis, what we're doing is we're looking at things like the makeup or the basic characteristics of the industry, the key economic and operating variables that drive industry performance, and the outlook for the industry. So what we really need to do is establish the competitive position of this industry with respect to other industries. And we need to identify the outlook of the industry and the risks inherent to the industry in order to determine whether there might be some securities in this industry that we might consider worthwhile. Now, the best way to do this, the best way to analyze an industry is by using Porter's Five Forces. First off, does this industry have any threat of new entrants? Is it easy to break into this in industry? Are there high barriers to entry? Because if not, chances are we might not want to invest in any firms that are in this industry because it's too easy for a new competitor to come in and steal market share. Next, we want to know whether or not there is significant rivalry between existing competitors. If that rivalry is very fierce and it leads to very low profit margins, that might be a case where we might want to avoid that industry. If it's a case where there are several competitors but they all sell a product that is slightly unique and they each maintain a healthy profit margin, then we might be all right in considering investing in that industry. Next, we want to know whether there's any pressure from substitute products. For example, if we're talking about the auto manufacturing industry, is it possible that in the next several years, everyone's going to be taking the bus, thus decreasing the demand for new vehicles, new cars? Well, if so, that would be a significant threat to that industry, the, the auto manufacturing industry. Next, we want to know whether or not the buyers of products in this industry have any power. And when I say the buyers have power, what I mean is that they're kind of dictating the price. I mean, we have a good where if we raise the price too much, these buyers won't buy. Maybe there's a substitute product out there, or maybe we're selling a good whose demand is elastic. These buyers don't need this product and they can essentially set the price that they're willing to pay. The final consideration that Porter's Five Forces asks us to make is with respect to the bargaining power of suppliers. Do our suppliers have the ability to raise their prices at will? I mean, can they increase the price that they charge us? If there are a lot of suppliers out there or potential suppliers for us to buy from to produce our product, then those suppliers probably don't have as much power as they would if there were very few suppliers. If there's very few suppliers for a given input, then those suppliers probably are going to have an easier time increasing the price of the goods that they're selling to us. So for example, if there's only one manufacturer of some component that's used to produce phones, that supplier potentially has a monopoly in that product and they can essentially set the price that they're selling that input for. So they have a huge amount of bargaining power. We wanna make sure that we're avoiding industries where the suppliers and the buyers have very high bargaining power. So. What I'm trying to get at here is when you're analyzing an industry, you need to take into account every single one of Porter's five forces because they're going to determine whether or not the industry you're considering investing in can remain profitable for the foreseeable future. Next, I need to talk about the industry life cycle. And the industry life cycle refers to this life cycle where the sales of the industry increase fairly rapidly and then we see a flattening out of sales growth, and then over time, we see a slight decrease in sales growth as new competitors or new substitute products move into this space and start taking sales away from our products in our industry. So the first step in the industry life cycle is the startup phase or the embryonic phase. So this is the part of the life cycle where someone invents a new product and this product is revolutionary. Well, 
there's probably going to be some very high startup costs. There's going to be a lot of risks. Potentially, there's going to be a lot of product failures. Uh, the trick here will be identifying how to uh, correct any bugs in the product, and we're going to see very rapid sales growth in, in this part of the growth life cycle. Next, we have growth. And this is, I mean, think of this as just stable growth. I mean, this would be the case where we see the most growth in the industry's sales revenue. And in this case, we see a large amount of new competitors entering the market and capturing new sales. Uh, market share might remain fairly constant, although one or maybe several competitors may be grabbing a significant portion of the market share. Near the end of this stable growth stage is maturity, or the slowing growth stage. And this is where sales revenue starts to flatten out a bit. And this is where the competitors start to consider merging with one another to increase their market share and potentially capture various segments of the, the industry. Maybe they capture a certain geographic area, or maybe they identify a tweak to the, the product in this industry that allows them to capture a certain individual or type of individual. And then the final stage is that relative decline stage. And this is where we see very low growth. Uh, so this might be the case where a product is like Coca-Cola, where there's very low growth uh, for the product, maybe it's only growing at 1% to 2% per year. Uh, that would be consistent with the overall GDP growth rate in most markets where Coke is being sold. And we might even see a slight decline as some new products like fizzy water or carbonated water start to steal market share from Coca-Cola. Uh, so that is the industry life cycle. A large number of industries actually follow this industry life cycle and this is just something that's that's well known. So let me give you an example of the industry life cycle, and this is the classic economic example that I'm sure if you stay in academia long enough, you'll probably become well familiar with this example. Uh, we don't want to be in industries like the buggy whip industry after 1920. So the reason we do industry analysis is to avoid cases where we invest in an industry where, yes, they might have a, a large sales revenue as an industry, but the product is rapidly becoming obsolete. So the market for buggy whips in the 1920s was decreasing rapidly because the automobile was increasing in prominence and popularity and total sales revenue. So we don't want to find ourselves in a declining or dying industry. So historically in this intro to investments class, I've given the example of JCPenney or uh, Macy's and I've, I've shown people this is why, I mean, this is a perfect example of an industry that we wouldn't want to invest in. And in the last two years, obviously we've seen a collapse in the, the retail industry with many of the competitors like JCPenney or Sears declaring bankruptcy or defaulting on their debt. So the, mar the market for uh, retail, clo retail clothing is very much like the buggy whip industry in the post-1920 period. So what I'm trying to get at here is we really don't want to invest in any securities in a troubled industry. That could lead to a rapid decline in the share prices of any stocks that we invest in. So just that's why we perform industry analysis. All right, I have a CFA question for you. Which of the following is least likely a characteristic of the mature stage of the industry life cycle? Industry consolidation, little or no growth, or C, barriers to entry? Well, if I go back to the chart, what you can see is that we see a significant decline in the sales of firms in this industry. And I did mention that a lot of consolidation occurs here, but a lot of industry consolidation where firms acquire or merge with their direct rivals also occurs here. So answer choice A, 
would certainly not be the correct answer. We do see a lot of industry consolidation as the market for a specific product matures. And then we do see little or no growth in the mature stage. The answer here is actually C, low barriers to entry. Mature stage industries typically have very high barriers to entry, and there's typically very little or no growth. So an example of this might again be Coca-Cola. I mean, the industry for sugary drinks is fairly mature, and Coca-Cola and Pepsi have really done a good job at reaching, I think, 175 or more countries. They've locked up agreements with stores around the world to sell Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Chances are the, the barriers to entry here are going to be pretty high. All right, so now let's talk about where you find industry-specific information. And this list is by no means complete, but here are some pretty good resources. First, Bloomberg. I'll, in a later video, show you how to use the Bloomberg intelligence and the market map functions, but suffice it to say, Bloomberg is one of the best tools that we have for industry-specific information. Next, we have Morningstar. And Morningstar can be accessed via its free version just through the internet, or if you want to go through the Ball State Library, you can. So let me show you how to do that. So let's go to Ball State Libraries. And we'll click Do Research. And type in Morningstar. And up near the top here, you're going to see the option to select Morningstar. And then we can actually go up to where it says Markets. And we can actually get industry reports and sector reports. So let's say we want to find out information about uh, various industries in quarter three of 2020. Well, we can. We can also identify the best sectors. We can identify valuation ratios. I mean, Morningstar really does a good job of providing a huge amount of information for us as investors. And they even do a good job of identifying individual securities in each industry or sector. So this is why I say Morningstar is probably our second best option when collecting information on industries. Next, we can actually look up the annual statements in Edgar for individual firms. And I realize we're looking at individual firm data, but the reason I say this is because the risks that affect one firm in an industry will also affect the other firms in the industry. So let me show you what I mean. Let's look for Ford. So here's Ford Motor Company. As you can see, its ticker symbol, or sorry, its SIC code is 3711. So let's type in 10K and get the firm's 10K or annual report. And we will open that up. And let's go down to their risks section. So we're down and risk factors are on page 12. And here we have a large number of risks that Ford itself has identified. And these same risks are going to be prevalent for Ford's major competitors, so GM, Honda, Toyota, maybe even Tesla. Now, we can also go to the Management's Discussion and Analysis section on page 27, and this will give us an indication of management's outlook on the future of the company. And so, again, this outlook should be fairly close to what the CEOs of Ford's direct competitors, GM, Honda, etc., are are expecting as well. So we might even see some forecasted data, uh, but we can also see some issues with respect to pricing pressure, energy price changes, vehicle profitability, trade policy. I mean, all of these factors that affect Ford are likely going to affect GM in some way. 
The next industry resource we can look at is the Fed's Beige Book. And the Beige Book gives us an indication of economic conditions for sectors or industries in each of the Fed regions. So let's say we want to look at economic conditions in Boston. Uh, we know that some retailers and manufacturers raised selling prices. Uh, we can go down to each of the regions themselves, and we can actually get a sense of, say, employment and wages in the Boston Fed District. Uh, it's seeing moderate growth, and we can also look at the retail and tourism sector here. So re retailers saw a 2% 2.8% to 4% year-over-year -year increase in uh, sales. If we go down here, we can look at residential real estate, the manufacturing industry, commercial real estate, and then we can go to the next Fed economic region. Next, occasionally accounting firms like uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers and Deloitte will put out industry outlook documents. And I won't go through one of these now. I'll, I'll post one on our Canvas site. But these things get pretty detailed, and they can provide some pretty decent information. And we can also look at analyst reports. Sometimes Zacks or Moody's or Credit Suisse will actually provide analyst reports or industry outlook uh, reports. And lastly, sometimes the SBA or Small Business Administration will provide industry outlook for various industries. All right, let's try one more CFA question. So in the event of expected economic slowdown and diminishing growth rates with respect to revenues and profits, an equity fund manager will most likely make changes to the portfolio by A, overweighting technology stocks, B, overweighting consumer staples, or C, underweighting utilities. All right, so this is a fairly interesting CFA level one question. So if there's a slowdown or a slowdown is expected, generally that slowdown could lead to a contractionary period in the business cycle. And we know that tech stocks typically have high betas and perform well during bull markets and not during bear markets, not during contractionary periods. So I would say that A would not be a likely answer. C underweighting utilities when there's an economic slowdown? Well, utilities are seen as defensive stocks. They do very well when there's an economic slowdown, and so we would definitely not want to underweight utilities if there's a an economic slowdown on its way. The correct answer here is B. We want to overweight consumer staples, and the reason for this is that Consumer staples, these might be anything from WD-40 to, oh, detergent. Uh, these are products that are always going to be in demand by consumers. These are products that are sold at Walmart, at Kroger. Even if you can't afford a new car, chances are you're going to need laundry, laundry detergent or WD-40. So we want to overweight securities that produce those goods in our portfolio if there's going to be an economic slowdown. All right, let's go ahead and recap. There are 11 GICS sectors of the economy. I mentioned those. Those are just well-recognized, and whenever you hear the word sector, you should just think of those. Next, we have several industry classification systems like SIC codes or NIACS codes, and those codes help us define an industry and the firms in the industry. Every firm will have an SIC code, and every firm will have a NIACS code. Next, the goal of industry analysis is to identify industries that are growing and do not face existential threats. So you don't want to be in the buggy whip industry in 1920, and you don't want to be in the retail industry for clothing in 2019 or 2020. Next, Porter's Five Forces are very important to us when we're performing industry analysis. We want to make sure that a firm has barriers to entry, 
its suppliers and its buyers have very low negotiating power, and the firm is profitable and it's, it's able to maintain its market share. Next, most industries follow a life cycle. It's just the industry life cycle. Typically, they'll start out and the industry will have very rapid growth, and then there will be a period of consolidation, maturity, and eventually decline. And then finally, there are a huge number of resources that we can make use of for industry analysis. Bloomberg, I didn't really touch on in this video, but I will in a later video. Morningstar, as you saw, you can get reports on industries and industry outlook. Edgar, you can look up individual securities and the risks associated with those securities and their competitors' risks as well. The Federal Reserve puts out the Beige Book. All of these are going to be great resources for you when you perform industry analysis. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much.